I do All the right. same way I did that. Did you go You're first wrong. slide that I sent you, Brother Ray? No. I apologize. Okay, what would you I did get this no, It's, did it's pretty read, interesting, read, though. Read, I, I hope you do get a chance, 35 minute chance to see it. I'll try to do that second. Well, look at it. I'll look at your time. Yeah. Your time is limited, I think. I stay on the go, I guess, more than I should. To me, this Hello everyone, we're going to have a couple songs this morning, and uh, we're going to start with 193, which is All the Way My Savior Leads Me. <clears throat> All three verses. <coughs> As we sing, oh, wait a minute. Let's have a word of prayer first. I almost forgot it this morning. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Lord's Day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today, and thank you for those that are listening at home. We just so happy to be able to hear your word, and, and we thank you for your precious blood that that has saved our souls, Lord. It's, it's a blessing to know that Jesus cares about us and loves us. So we need to love you and, and we, we need your help in giving us faith in the, with the problems we have in our country today, Lord. It's, it's, uh, it's sad to see so many hateful people, Father and the things that they want to do to destroy our country, and especially to destroy our worship. Forgive us, Lord. We have faults as well, and, and we ask you to help us to, that we might fight the desire to sin. It's a hard thing, Lord, and, and we need you to help us. Father, there's so many that we love that are lost, and we ask you to bless them and and bless Brother Ray's brother and and uh, those others that prayer has been requested we especially ask you to bless Shirley and in, in her trials and tribulations she's going through help her Lord that she might not suffer so much and, and uh, my wife Betty as well she she hurts all the time, Lord, and, and she needs your, your healing grace. Just be with all of us in the trials and the sicknesses and the pains that we go through and the worry. We worry a lot about things, and, and we really need you to comfort us, Lord. Just help us to pray and study and, and do your will, whatever it is. And most of all, help each and every one of us to bear fruits. We're part of the vine, and, and we ask you to keep us strong and healthy. So bless our singing now and the rest of our service, and especially bless Brother Ray that, that he might give us the word that you would have him to. And just thank you for the opportunity to hear him and the word today. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay. Now we're going to go to All the Way My Savior Leads Me. As we sing. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy? who through life has been my guide. Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, 
Cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, let a spring of joy I see. Blessing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal wings the flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Amen. For our next hymn, we're going to turn to one. Come Thou Fount. In our book, uh, All American Church Hymnal, it's 328. <clears throat> You think so? Page one is what I think they're going to say. No, I think it's right. Come back out. Come back out. Okay. I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, everybody got it? Okay, as we sing. Come the fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. And I hope by thy good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Thank you. Brother Ray, would you come? Appreciate that, Brother Kenny. Okay. 
In the Gospel of John, chapter 16, last week we looked at persecution foretold, which is verses 1 through 6. This week we're looking at the promise of the Holy Spirit and his office, and this is verses 7 through 15 of the Gospel of John. John chapter 16, verse 7 through 15. And um, many of these things, and I was going through studying this, thinking about this, many things we've covered already about the Holy Spirit. But this particular passage highlights the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, our Lord talks about the necessity of himself departing in order that the Holy Spirit might come but also the necessity of him parting so that the work that he has completed in the uh, crucifixion and his keeping of the law perfectly and then in his death, his burial, and his resurrection uh, could, in a sense, be applied to us uh, as the blood was applied to the, the altar in the Old Testament. Thus it is that he applies to the Father his finished work in our behalf and that it's necessary for his physical presence to depart in order that the Holy Spirit could come and take on the roles that he has in our life. And I've emphasized multiple times that the Holy Spirit is the major person of the Godhead that is involved in our lives. And the interesting thing about him, and it's brought out a little bit in this passage, is he never talks about himself. His theme is the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the theme of the Holy Spirit. And so verse 7 of chapter 16 reads, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Uh, Chapter 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16, our Lord is going to great trouble, I guess you would say, or great concern to express his affection his instruction and his guidance to his 11 disciples and then in effect to us as he displays his love and of course no greater love as he mentioned last week and a man showed than to lay down his life for his friends and he goes on to describe his disciples and he tells them you are not my servants you are my friends and I keep you up to date as to what's going on Uh, in this world and what's going on in the world hereafter and the places I go to prepare a place for you. You're not servants that I tell you to go here and do this and do there and do that. And at the end of the day, you can lay down your head and forget it until the next day. But he says, I I enlist your service. I enlist your um, army in effect as uh, carrying on armed Christian soldiers in effect. The, The gospel, the ministry, and that you have an understanding as to what we're about and uh, what the future holds for us. And so he calls them friends and keeps them informed as to what's going on. Both the Father, or excuse me, both the Son, Jesus, and the Spirit are referred to as comforters in Scripture. And we'll look at a few verses along these lines. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Well, there's an interesting phrase, the truth. Uh, it's kind of frustrating watching the news and watching all the politics that are going on. And... Uh, and, and you're sitting there, you're watching, and say, well, now, where is the truth in this matter? And uh, it gets kind of depressing. Well, one of the things that makes it so depressing is so many people in the news media are lost people. And they look at things from a viewpoint of being lost. And they have no interest in the things of God, and they consider the things of God to be uh, foolishness, and that's what the gospel, the preaching of the gospel is described by Paul. He says to some, it's a stumbling stone, and to others, it's foolishness. And so to hold to the values and the instruction that we receive in God's word, the world would say that is foolishness. And that will explain the opposition that we have in our daily lives from those around us. As uh, I remember Urban Wallace saying this when he was still alive, he said, if the world knew what we really believed, they would kill us. Well, we're down to that point. 
You know, you're seeing them kill people or Christians around the world. And uh, you're seeing a tremendous opposition here in this country. Uh, if there was any, well, one of the things, again, listening to the news this morning was people are starting to push back and start to ask questions. And uh, I remember asking questions from the beginning. How could I go to Kroger and there'd be hundreds of people and how could I go to Lowe's? And after the crackdown and the closure, Lowe's and Home Depot were busier than they were before. I mean, people everywhere, and yet you couldn't go to church, couldn't go out to eat, uh, and then you had small businesses closing their doors because they couldn't afford to keep open, couldn't pay their 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 notes and the, uh, their rent and whatnot. And, and so you wonder where the truth is in this matter. Uh, but uh, Brother Dale pointed out in his message this morning, Psalms 2, uh, that he speaks to, uh, that the... the, the Basically, the plans of the wicked, the Lord laughs at them, uh, and he'll bring them to naught. Uh, uh, man can plan all he wants, but God is the one who disposes. And so, nevertheless, verse 7 of chapter 16 of John, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. In other words, the benefits of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives are, are brought to us, and the Holy Spirit comes, and he's, the Holy Spirit is the one that we're dependent on this morning. Uh, each time I stand up here, I pray the Holy Spirit meet with us. He's the one who will teach us. He's the one who will open our understanding. Uh, he's the one that often gives me words that I don't even plan on saying. Uh, and I, I hope for those times when I stand up here and I look at my outline and I look at the, the study that I've done, and, and I think to myself, I don't have anything to say. Brother Dale calls it moments of desperation, and at times it just seems like the one word after another comes out, and I, and I believe it's the Spirit that gives these words to me at those times uh, to speak. And so we're dependent upon the Spirit for this. We're dependent upon the Spirit to open our ears. We can stand and sit and listen to preaching and teaching and yet be a, a million miles away. And so it's the Spirit sometimes it gets our attention. It's the Spirit that convicts us, uh, makes us see ourselves as sinners in need of a Savior. It's the Spirit that draws us. And, and so he'll go into, in this passage, uh, the benefits that we have from the Spirit's work here amongst us. He goes on to say, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart... I will send him unto you. And so there's some benefits to our Lord's disciples if he'll go away. And it has to do with the comforter. And this word comforter is the word par paraclete in the Greek. And the, the word paraclete means one who pleads the cause of another. We would think in terms of a lawyer. Also one who exhorts, in other words, encourages, defends, comforts, Praise for another. It is a title given to the Holy Spirit by Christ in John 14, 16. In chapter 14, verse 16, our Lord refers to the Holy Spirit. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another paraclete, another comforter, another one to plead your cause, that he might abide with you forever. And I pointed out to you at that time, our Lord's presence with his disciples was limited, basically three years, a little bit over three years. But here he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll be with you forever. He'll not depart. He'll not leave you. He'll always be with you. And then in, in chapter 15, verse, 20, uh, verse 26, again, our Lord refers to the Holy Spirit. But when the Comforter is come, the word paraclete again is used here, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And then verse 7 of chapter 16, nevertheless I tell you the truth, which is our passage today. And so also then our Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the Comforter. In 1 John 2, 1, my little children, this is how he addresses his uh, uh, disciples here. This is how he dis uh, addresses the church. We had a house full of children 
uh, yesterday, and our neighbors next door usually comes over. We invite them over. He's a retired minister, and uh, I, I, she said she was a school teacher. And I asked her if all these children were making her nervous, and they were running around and around in circles. They went through the kitchen around, they run through there, and they were chasing each other, and everybody was telling them to slow down and, and, and you know, and whatnot. And there was a lot of turmoil going on in here. And I asked her, I said, yeah. And I asked her, I said, is this bothering you? She said, no, I'm an elementary school teacher. And she says, I kind of enjoy hearing the, the children. And, and so uh, it, it tickles me for the children to come, you know, over here. And she said, well, you're very blessed, you know. And, and I said, well, thank you. I think so. Uh, you know, and, uh, and so a ton of children everywhere. And, uh, of course, uh, the latest one, uh, so far as Grandma's concerned, can do no wrong. And, uh, and that's Amber's little one. And uh, uh, he, uh, he seems to have even taken to me, so... Uh, he'll sit in my lap and pull the buttons on my shirt and whatnot. And, and so you have this affection, and an affectionate way our Lord addresses here the church is uh, John is talking to the church there. He says in John, 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate. That's the paraclete again. With the Father... Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so our Lord is referred to by one of his disciples, John in particular, as a paraclete. Then in Romans 8, 34, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And so he is our intercessor with the Father. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have one other passage along this lines. But here in these passages that we've read, we see that both the Holy Spirit, our Lord refers to as the paraclete or the comforter. And then we find that uh, 1 John, then Paul, and then Paul again in Hebrews the same way. In Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore? He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And that's referring to our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And so we have this word paraclete that's applied by our Lord to the Holy Spirit. And, of course, this passage of Scripture that we're looking at this morning, verses 7 through 15, emphasize the work of the Holy Spirit and, and the benefit of our Lord departing from his disciples so that the Holy Spirit can be sent from the Father unto them. Then we read in John 16, 8, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. And it lists three things here, sin, righteousness, and justice. And in the next three verses, break these down, each individually, but of sin. And, of course, this is what is needed in this world. Uh, men, by nature, think that they're okay. And, you know, it was real popular for a while, the phrase, you're okay and I'm okay. And everybody had that attitude. And then now it's, it, there's nothing that's wrong, you know. And, of course, they use this in the description of homosexuality. You know, what you think is wrong might not necessarily be wrong for someone else. And then it's quite common for people to say, well, you have your values and I have mine, as opposed to the fact that, that there is a set of values given to us in the Word of God that is an absolute. And uh, it's the standard by which all things are measured. And so man might try to change the standard. I always use that example, and I've used it too many times, but... And machinist has a set of standards. And um, that set of standards they use to make sure their tools remain accurate. And ever so often they'll open up this box of standards. Usually the ones I've seen are wooden boxes that they had made themselves. And they will take their tools and they will adjust them according to these standards. And, and they will not change the standard they will change their tools to match the standard. And so it is that we have 
that, uh, that we have an example then in a machinist world that standards are uh, that which determines what is right, what is wrong. In a making of an engine for a car, if you had uh, a machinist working on the car and one had one set of standards and another one had another set of standards, that I prefer these standards to your standards, and, and so they're making different parts for this car, when they get ready to turn that car and start it, it's just not gonna run. <laughs> it's either gonna leak oil or it's gonna rub and, and get hot. And, and so they have a set of standards that, that, and of course they work with plus or minus thousands. Well, we come to everyday life and how do, does the world judge matters? Well, you have your standards and I have my standards as if there is not an absolute set of standards. And that is the word of God that has determined what is right and what is wrong. And of course, the Bible goes on to say, when this world is gone and when this world is burned up, uh, the word of God will remain. And so it is the absolute standards as to what is right and what is wrong. And one of the duties of the Holy Spirit, as our Lord points out here is, he will convict the world of sin. Now he's talking to his disciples in the and the, and the framework of the discussion is in reference to his rejection by the Jews. And so not only will he convict the Jews of sin, and this is what enraged them and why they wanted to destroy him. You tell somebody they're wrong and they'll, they'll stick out their bottom lip and they'll want to fight. And, and, and that's part of what was going on here. But then in application, it's applied to mankind in general. And so he will convict the world of sin and then the next phrase is, and of righteousness. In other words, the Holy Spirit will also then uh, uh, reprove the world of righteousness. And the word righteousness is a word that deals with the quality of being fair and unpartial or impartial. And it's interesting, and I find it interesting to watch uh, uh, Mr. Barr and... Uh, uh, the, the thing that they try to accuse him of is being partial and that politics are affecting the decisions that he's making. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he has a reputation of, of being very uh, straight-laced and impartial. Uh, working with children, you, you'll get accused uh, that, you are, that you're showing favoritism. You know? And uh, we sent home with Daniel a box of, of uh, plaques yesterday. And I didn't know if he'd want them or not. You know, these are all the way back to T-ball and, you know, midget and whatnot. And, of course, he would always win all the plaques. And, um, and there were times when I would not give him a plaque. And I, I remember Robert Harmon. He passed away a few years ago. He was one of my assistant coaches. And, uh, and so I would give uh, a, a, a most valuable player to one of the other children at times. And he reprimanded me for it. He says, you know Daniel's one of these. And, and, but I wouldn't give it to him because he already had 15 years of trophies, you know. It was ridiculous. Uh, the, and, uh, and so I tried to be impartial in that sense that I didn't show favoritism. And uh, uh, pro probably to the point that, that I was probably wrong in, in the sense. But I was also thinking in terms of Daniel. Daniel doesn't need to have... A, a, a sense that he was uh, the best all of the time, you know. And, uh, and so I was thinking in terms of, of limiting to a certain extent that in his life. Well, you have to then as the coach to be impartial. At one point, I was offered a job to FedEx if I would give the little boy a, a, a trophy, of one of the three trophies we gave out. And uh, Robert was doing his best to get me to give the little boy the trophy. And I just couldn't do it because I would have to rob somebody else that, you know, we had most valuable, uh, most improved and so forth. And I'd have to rob somebody else to give him the trophy and I didn't do it. And I didn't get a job at FedEx. And probably a good thing I didn't because I probably wouldn't be happy at FedEx. Mm -hmm. But uh, Robert, I guess, had been promised a job too, I guess. And, and he already had a good job, but uh, I could not bring myself to give a, a someone who did not deserve the trophy a trophy. Well, that was part of being trying to be impartial in an imperfect world. And so this is one of the things that, that uh, the, our Lord says the Holy Spirit will do is he will uh, reprove the world in regards to righteousness or right, in effect. And he will reprove the world in regards to judgment. 
and this word judgment really would be better understood currently as justice, what is right and what is not right, what is just and what is unjust. And of course, we deal with this, and if you watch history at all on TV, they're always attacking uh, the history of this country. And, and, and so we need to go back and we need to pay, repar pay reparation, reparations uh, to the slaves and to the Indians and probably to the Chinese that built the railroads and, and on and on and on. And, and, and uh, uh, there has to be at some point uh, understanding there's no way to, to do this, and yet it doesn't make any difference. Someone who was uh, descended of, of these uh, different groups of people uh, doesn't care that financially it would you know, not be beneficial to the country and to themselves in the long run. Uh, it's never beneficial to a person to get something free. And that's the big debate right now about these uh, stimulus checks. Um, is it, you're paying people not to work in effect, you know. Uh, what stimulates people more than anything else is being hungry. <laughs> you get hungry, you'll get busy and start to work. And, and right now, we have uh, welfare and handouts and and I drive the city and there's always these long lines and I know instantly what they're there for. They're handing out free food and uh, they're doing this all over the city. Uh, and they usually have to have policemen there protecting the lines and making sure everybody's behaving themselves and, and whatnot. And uh, I drive by and I look at the cars. They're all nicer char cars than I'm driving. <laughs> and they're lined up for free food. And they probably have a welfare little flag card in their pocket. Well, we're creating a generation in which they expect something for nothing. And eventually it will bottom out. And when it does, they're they're, raised, they're, they're raised like that. it's going to be a mess when it finally bottoms out. And so in verse 18, or verse 8, excuse me, he lists these three, these three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then verse 9, verse 10, in verse 11, he deals with each one of these things separately. In verse 9, of sin, why? Because they believe not on me. Well, who's that? Well, that's the Jews. They rejected the Messiah in particular, but that's mankind in general. The application in, the, the, in putting this portion of Scripture in the time frame in which it was written in regards to who was rejecting our Lord, it was the Jews in general, and the Holy Spirit will convict of sin because they believe not on me. Not absolutely. There are Jews even today that are saved uh, that come to a knowledge of the Lord as a Savior. But there is not an overwhelming among, amount among them. Generally speaking, the church is made up of Gentile people. Of sin because they believe not on me. The Holy Spirit then will convict them of this sin. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and ye see me no more. Well, why did he go to the Father? Well, we started off with that this afternoon. He went to the Father in a, in a sense to lay out before the Father his finished work on our behalf. And he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And he physically departed this world, but he said it's beneficial for his disciples that he depart because then the Holy Spirit would be sent from the Father and the Holy Spirit would then do this, the following things. He will convict the world or he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, uh, that, that is that being fair. And I've pointed this out before. No one ever gets away with anything. Although in life, sometimes it seems like they do. Uh, you think about someone cleaning, a, a child cleaning their room, and, and, and they stuff all the things into the closet. <laughs> and somebody opens the closet door and they come all popping out, you know. They kind of put everything in the closet. Or somebody's sweeping the floor and they're picking up the carpet and they're sweeping it under the carpet and hiding it. Well, when it comes to sin, no one ever gets away with anything. God is perfectly fair and he's perfectly just and everyone will be held accountable and everyone will have to answer for their sin. Well, our sin is answered for us in Christ, but to the lost world, there will be an accountability and the books will be open. 
and, and everything will be listed in, in, in those books that they're guilty of, and it will be read out before the world. And, and, and so he goes to the Father, and he makes peace with the Father. He balances uh, the account. He balances our account so that it's perfectly balanced in that he uh, has taken the penalty due to us upon himself and he's finished it and he's paid it in full and so there's a perfect balance with the father and the holy spirit then will bring men to an understanding uh, that they are unbalanced or have a debt and that this debt if by faith is put upon christ then they are brought to this point of being uh, impartial or perfectly balanced in this effect then in verse 11 of judgment Again, verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, recap what verse 8 talked about. Verse 11, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is judged. And I was thinking of something, and it's gone in and out of my mind. Uh, but uh, uh, all these videos, Kristen, our, our granddaughter in Maine, made a video, and Howard next door one of his uh, children made a video and uh, they put something, uh, a brownie, I think he said, on the table in front of the, the kid and opened it up so they could see it and laid the lid down. They could see the frosting on the lid and told them not to touch it and said, I'll go away and I'll be back in a little bit. And, uh, and you could see the kid looking and, uh, you know. Well, Kristen did the same thing with her two except the older one knew that there was a camera there. <laughs> and, and he told his sister, and of course his sister is nothing like her mama, looks like her mama, but she's nothing like her mama. <laughs> she's messy, and, and, and Kristen's always, you know, very precise. But uh, the little boy said, Mama said not to touch it. And the girl, little girl was doing this <laughs> looking, and said, no, no, you're not supposed to touch it. And then pretty soon he gets up in front of the camera and starts making faces. <laughs> And I told Howard, I said, now, if, if they had been Adam and Eve and the Lord had told them not to touch it, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in, you know, <laughs> because he told them not to eat of the fruit of the tree. Uh, and so these kids, uh, I guess very fearful of their parents or whatever, uh, didn't do, they didn't touch what they, they were told not to touch. Now, of course, that was in a very limited time frame. But uh, uh, you have here then, I think, an example of this that he will uh, convict the world of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Satan is alive and well, and he is real, and he is more powerful than we are, and uh, we need to be aware of that. He symbolized in, in false religions as the yin and the yang, that, and I've talked about the little tadpoles, the black and the white tadpole chasing each other around, but, and the whole idea behind that is that good and evil are equal. And you can choose the good or you can choose the bad. But the reality of the matter is that Christ is not equal to Satan and Satan's not equal to Christ. Christ rules over Satan. And Satan's future has already been determined. And so we can take comfort in that, that Satan is not equal to the Son. But we also need to realize we need to, to take comfort in the Son and we need to take safety. We need to flee to Jesus. And that we are told that because we are born-again Christians, we can now resist the devil and he will flee from us. And so verse 11 says, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Taking us all the way back to Genesis 3.15, that there would be one born of the woman that would bruise the head of Satan. It says there in Genesis 3.15, he would bruise our Lord's heel, but that uh, the, the one born of the woman would bruise his head. And so Satan uh, attempts our Lord. And... Uh, our Lord quotes scripture to him, and, and Satan argues his case. Uh, but he thought that he had won when they nailed Jesus to the tree. He thought he had the victory. He got them to uh, execute Jesus, in effect. Uh, but in reality, with the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ, Satan's future has been secured. He's been judged. Uh, is for sure. There's no doubt about what the future holds for him. 
and it's been determined by the fact of the gospel, but which is the good news, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And so this is one of the things that the Holy Spirit will do then. And then verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. And uh, they're not able to handle it because of their grief. They're not able to understand it because they just didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear that he was going away. But he, he tells them that one of the things the Spirit will do is remind you and encourage you and enable you to, to do the continuing of the work. These 11 disciples and then later the Apostle Paul uh, called as a special apostle out of, out of time. He was actually trained by our Lord in the backside of the wilderness and uh, prepared for the work that he did. And they set things in order in the churches. In, the, in Acts, as you go through, you get basically a history book of the early church. And the thing that the apostles would do is, this is what Jesus taught, and then they would enlarge upon it. And that's what the rest of our New Testament is. This is what Jesus taught. And the, the disciples would enlarge and make application to the churches. And they would establish churches, and they would appoint elders. You know, today we'll go through a process of choosing a pastor. Back then, at times, the apostle says, this man here, and he's going to be the pastor here. And so they would set things up in order in the churches. And then when things were out of order, one of the things the apostles would do is they would come and rebuke the churches uh, where they were out of order and bring them back to the standard and reestablish things. And so this is the authority the apostles had that ministers do not have today. Ministers have the authority from God's word. The word is the standard. God's word had not been fully given at that point. And so the apostles were the ones that would go by and say, this is wrong, this is right, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do, this is where you need to be corrected, this is where you need to discipline this person, this is where you need to receive this person back. And they would set things in order in the early churches. And so this is one of the things our Lord would do through these apostles, these 11 apostles, uh, his disciples at this point, and then later apostles, and that this would be part of the work of the Holy Spirit amongst them. Verse 13 how be it when he, the spirit of truth, and I emphasize that, the spirit of truth, and I emphasize the standard, uh, there is such a thing as wrong, there is such a thing as right, and there are absolutes. And I don't care what the world says, I don't care what tradition says, I don't care what, what uh, uh, the homosexuals say, or the abortion, pro-abortion people say, or what the Democrats say, or even what the Republicans say, uh, there is a standard of what is right and what is wrong. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide, guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever, I shall, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And so again, here's the emphasis. The Holy Spirit does not blow his own horn, but he will guide, and he will instruct, and he will tell us a future things to come. Uh, the Holy Spirit then, and you would think in terms of the sheep and the shepherd leading or guiding the sheep, and you might even think of a sheep dog that's guiding the sheep, and if you've seen different uh, groups, uh, you know, I, I was privileged to watch a shepherd, and I tried to do some research on it, could not find anybody that remembered this, but in my teenage years, right where Greenback and, and uh, uh, Madison come together, just before you go across the bridge into the city of Folsom, there's this high brown grassy mountain or hill to the left. Uh, today it has mansions on it. Back then there was a shepherd that lived at the top. And he would bring the sheep down twice a day, hundreds of them, and they would block eight lanes of traffic going across, and then they would drop off this high down to what was called Rattlesnack Bar to the American River where he would water the sheep, and then he would take them back up. And so I was privileged to experience that, and I was amazed. Although that area is referred to as Shepherd Hills, nobody seemed to remember the history of it. Hmm. Of course, that's only been 40-some years ago, maybe 50 years ago. But, um, and, and, and of course, we've seen different uh, demonstrations of sheep and shepherds and their, their work. But this was quite common in our Lord's day. And here the, 
Holy Spirit then is spoken of as one who will guide. We need guidance. We need, uh, Brother Kenny prayed in regards to uh, repentance and forgiveness uh, this morning. Uh, that's something we constantly need to seek is forgiveness and repentance in regards to our sin and that we need guidance in our lives. And I have learned the hard way, and I guess I've learned it. I hope I've learned it. Sometimes I wonder if I've learned it. Not to try to make too many decisions or any decisions without praying about the matter. Right. I have found that I get myself in hot water when I do, and instead of seeking the Lord's guidance on the, on the matter. Ever so often, Elaine will ask me about something, and I, I don't have any comments anymore to say, well, this is the way it absolutely ought to be. You know, because I've made so many bad decisions in the past that I realize that and financially and otherwise that these are not things to do. And, and so we let the Lord lead. And you can kind of rest and let the Lord open the doors and close the doors. And I've found that to be true in my life, that, that the Lord has opened doors and he has closed doors at times. And, uh, uh, and he will because he is actively involved in our lives. And he has a future for us. And he knows what the future holds for us because he's the one who holds the future. And he uh, has then plans. And here we find that the Holy Spirit, one of the things he does is that he leads. And then we read in verse 14, and he shall glorify me. Well, whoa. What's it all about? Well, it's about Jesus. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's about Jesus. And what is one of the duties of the Holy Spirit? He will blow Jesus' horn. He will glorify Jesus. He will point him out to us as the only way of salvation. He will bring us to a knowledge of him, and he will bring us to an attitude of searching or seeking out him. And so he shall glorify me, for he will receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And so the Holy Spirit then teaches. He reminds the apostles, the disciples, of what the Lord taught them. They will put it down in print, and now we study that print. Our ministers open up the Bible and, and, and speak in regards to this gospel that has been given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament. And it's all about Jesus. And in verse 15, All things that the Father hath are mine, and therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. We are referred to as joint heirs with Christ and that we will inherit what he inherits. And, and uh, I was listening, and I, I don't know why this passage came up. I was listening to somebody speak about this. And he said, you know, if you have uh, children, they will get an equal share often of the inheritance. If you have four children, they would get one-fourth each. But he says in regards to being adopted, which is a reference to uh, us as Christians that we're adopted into the family of God, that we will receive a full share not a partial share. So whatever is Christ is ours. And, and that's a realm that we can't identify with or completely understand. But he says here in verse 15, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Just a, a, qu a quick uh, hash of what we've covered so far in chapters 14, 15, and 16. The supper was over. And we have then his parting was imminent. But Jesus would not leave the chamber till he had poured out his inmost heart in those tender, conciliatory, profoundly spiritual addresses which the beloved disciple John has preserved for us in 14, 15, and 16. And, and as I study this and as I speak to you each Sunday, I think about this. They are profound, and they are speaking the heart of our Lord as he was approaching death and, and what he was about to go through, and yet I feel sometimes that I don't do an adequate job of, of bringing out how uh, much affection our Lord is showing towards his disciples and indirectly towards us. Then it ends with chapter 17, which is coming up, which is actually what I often refer to as the actual Lord's Prayer in which he intercedes on our behalf. Uh, he was leaving them. And they were just upset about this. They would not see him again, and yet they would see him. And if you'll remember, when he appeared to the, the disciples on the road, they didn't recognize him until after he spoke to them for a while, and then he disappeared. Well, what does he mean by he, they will not see him again? Well, he appears back after the resurrection to them. 
but he has to identify himself to them. In other words, they don't see him in his earthly flesh, in his humbled uh, uh, self, but they see him in his glorified self uh, when he appears. He is fully human, but he doesn't appear in, in the humiliation that he had as he was upon this earth, the creator of all the universe come down and, and, and born as a babe and then grow up and learn authority, uh, uh, submit himself to his earthly parents' authority. They will not see him in that light. They will see him then in a glorified light. And we read here then in chapter 14, verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Verse 16 of chapter 16, A little while and ye shall not see me again, and a little while ye shall see me because I go to the Father. And so as he appeared and, and uh, Martha or Mary came to him, I don't remember which one, he said, Don't touch me for I have not yet been glorified. And, and there appears then that he ascended to heaven and then he came back down to the earth for a short time uh, and then he'll come again. And we have no idea when. I've always believed, you know, I've listened and I've studied uh, different people's eschatology. I've always believed that we should always be ready that the Lord could come at any moment. And that, and that don't necessarily always fit into, I had a man tell me one time, a man that you all would know if I was to name him, he said, no, certain things have to happen before the Lord will come again. I said, well, yeah, it may be true. But I believe that at any moment, and when people are not expecting him, uh, he will return. And I could just imagine if this country falls apart, we'll be wishing the Lord would return. And if we lived in some of the other parts of the world where the countries have fallen apart, I imagine those people there were wishing that the Lord would return. And so he will return, he says here, but I'll not leave you comfortless. And he goes on to say in chapter 14, verse 16, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. There's a natural rejection of, of the blinded world. Neither know him, they have no affection for him, but ye know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you, chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. And then the passage that we looked at today, verses 7 through 14 in chapter 16, we'll not read again, but these all deal with, with this uh, giving of the Holy Spirit. Then it goes on to say, if he went away, he would go to prepare a place, chapter 14, verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Again, our Lord's tender concern for his disciples. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then in verse 15 of chapter 14, he says, You'll show your love to me by keeping my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which hath sent me. And in the Spirit himself, the Father would dwell in the souls of the loved ones, of those that love him. Chapter 14, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Verse 22. Judas said unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord. How is it that thou wilt manifest thyself to us and not unto the world? Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So it speaks of the Father and the Son abiding with the Christian who is obedient. Then you have the, uh, the love that's shown in this union. In John 15, 1, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman, the essential of abiding in him, in other words. 
And then we would have tribulation in chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Or 16, 1, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Then on his dying request, he left him his own peace. 14, verse 27, John 14, 27, peace. I leave with you my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And then that would sustain their hearts in all trial in John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And then with many other promises, he comforts them in John 17, 9 and in 18 uh, 24 and then the last part of this chapter uh, and lord willing we'll look at this maybe next sunday maybe wednesday i'm not sure john 16 verse 16 through 22 christ's departure and return is what's covered in these verses chapter 16 verse 16 through 22 any thoughts or questions before we dismiss Well, we're told that he appeared unto 500 at one point. Uh, he appeared unto uh, the people on the road to Damascus uh, as they were traveling. Uh, he appeared unto his disciples at least twice. The first time Thomas was not there. The second time Thomas was there. Uh, he's seen uh, with uh, John and Peter and James when he is... When he, after his after his resurrection, after his resurrection, uh, and uh, and so I don't have a count on it, but he appeared uh, enough that is one uh, one Jewish fellow that was converted to Christianity said there's enough evidence in Scripture uh, to prove that Jesus arose from the dead. He says in court you only need two witnesses, and, and the Bible gives us at least five hundred at one point that saw him after he rose from the dead. And so, from a legal viewpoint, there was multiple witnesses that would testify. But to give you an exact number, I couldn't tell you. It was more than once, though. Well, how many times do you think he will come back? I think once, myself. Yeah, there are those, and again, same person. <laughs> you know what the name of it is. I was surprised. Uh, but... Uh, he had this view that the, the Jews will dwell in heaven and the Gentiles on earth, or Gent Gentiles will dwell in heaven, Jews on earth, I'm not sure which. And then that the, uh, there's these multiple comings. And, and there are many brethren that hold these multiple comings. Uh, I believe in a single return and that there will be a dividing. Uh, and I also am not dogmatic to the point that if somebody has a different view about it, you know, I'm never dogmatic about something that hasn't happened. Uh, our Lord's disciples were dogmatic that Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom, and it just wasn't so. He told Pilate his kingdom was not of this world. It was a spiritual kingdom. And I think we ought to learn from that. When, when the scripture talks about the future, we need to, to not be too dogmatic about what it's saying simply because it just hasn't happened yet. And I think uh, that there will be many surprised people, and it may be me, yeah, again, I'm just not dogmatic about it, but my general feeling is that there's one return, a single return. That's my general feeling and my general belief. And I'm not dogmatic. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. He's talking about uh, when Christ was crucified and, and how Satan was involved. Are you saying that Satan was not in was he encouraging the crucifixion? Oh yeah. So so Christ would be killed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what's the question. <laughs> uh, he, he wanted Christ to be crucified. Or he, he didn't want him to be crucified because that would save us. He didn't understand. 
He just didn't understand. I don't think he understood that. Didn't have the knowledge then. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. he, he said, this is the master's son was killing. You know, our Lord gave several different examples of that. And, uh, but he, what it took in effect is what he thought he had victory. It, it sealed his defeat. Yeah, he hated Christ. Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, by his death well, and burial and resurrection. He had enough sense to know that who he was and that he, he could be raised from the dead. I think he, um, he was, uh, got the big head and he thought he could get the victory. Yeah. And that he could displace. Uh, it, it, his fall originally was that he wished to be like God. Yeah, right. You know, and uh, he he thought if he could get rid of Jesus, that he would be the, and he was considered the God of this world, and still is the God yeah. of this world. Uh, and that's why you see so much news. It's so negative and so depressing, mm -hmm. because he's actively involved in this world. Yeah. Uh, President Reagan pointed this out uh, that. The, and it's pointed out in the Old Testament that countries have an evil angel or a heavenly angel that rules over those countries. And that he referred to Russia and to uh, China and to, I think, her, uh, he referred to three countries as being evil empires. Yeah. And this goes back to the Old Testament that talks about how some have a, a good and some have an evil. I think in this country uh, we come close to having a good one right now. Uh, but that's what I thought about Ronald Reagan. And the next thing we get is Clinton, you know, mm -hmm. and how we went from one extreme to the other. And so that, it was kind of depressing to me to realize uh, that the good leadership of this country, by God's grace, but then your next one that comes in the office could be far worse than the one that's there mm -hmm. or has been there. Okay. And so uh, uh, the bottom line is that uh, Jesus is on the throne. We can, we can try to do the best and we have the, the ability to have elections and to choose leaders, but ultimately the one that's placed on the throne, and we might refer to the president as on the throne, is the one that the Lord places there. And well, we might not like him. Me is the, is the, the evil and the hatred of ungodly people. Just the thought of them wanting to murder babies. It, it just, mm -hmm. I got and that's what Brother Dale pointed out in his message this morning. Evil seems to be getting faster and more and more and more and more. Yeah. Seems to be at a faster pace. It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, on the other hand, you've seen people that's very religious and they want, you know, they're explaining why they want it a certain way or why God would put it, you know, there for them. One of the things that they said about the 1700s in this country, after the, uh, uh, that we won our freedom from England, mm -hmm. is it was very wicked in this country, extremely wicked. In the United States? Uh-huh. And that's when they had the Great Awakening. Uh, and Jonathan Edwards and Charles Whitfield and uh, others, led a tremendous revival in this country. But it was after there was a very low period in this country. Um, I remember Wayne Cox saying this about the Depression. The reason why the churches were full in the 50s was that the people had lived through the Depression. And, and, and so one of the highlights of their life was to go and hear the gospel preached. And, and y'all might remember when the churches were fuller than they are now. Uh, yeah. you, you know, and when I talk about church, I'm talking about those that preach the word, not talking about those that entertain. Yeah. Uh, and that's what as the fellow that died, Zacharias, said recently. That, uh, or now it was the other fellow that I have, Paul Washer, said that uh, churches that are uh, uh, like uh, Disney World, you know, they go. To, you have to, you go there to be entertained, and he says, uh, no longer is it. No longer preaching the, the gospel or the truth. Any other thoughts before we dismiss? Uh, talking about the church, I remember when Woodlawn, after it started, I mean, we had like 240 in Sunday school. Mm -hmm. In Sunday school? Mm -hmm. In Sunday school? Uh, yes. Wow. Of course, I was a child, but I, I, and, it, and it has dwindled down to nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. And it 
did dwindle down to nothing. Right. Mine went to Speedway. It was, it was just packed with people. Mm -hmm. and, 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 mm -hmm. Anyway, um, they yeah. didn't, they didn't, uh, they did, did they, they didn't mean to, I don't think they did, because he wouldn't have said it. His uh, last name was Harris, the pastor. He says, all you have to do is, is pray the sinner's prayer. Sinner's prayer, you know, yeah. And uh, you'll be saved. Mm -hmm. And he would not believe how many people went up. My sister was one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The one I started with. Okay. In other words, there's so many people uh, think they're saved simply because they've prayed the sinner's prayer. Uh, but it has not changed the way they live. Right, right. Uh, and so... It might have changed their mind, but not their heart. Paul Washer, and, and, and I posted it on my Facebook. If you get a chance, it, it, it'll be tough to listen to, but he talks about that. How many, Our churches are full of people that, mm -hmm. because they, they uh, have written in their Bible that the preacher said, write down this date now that you've prayed the sinner's prayer. And whenever you have any doubt, just open your Bible up and look back at this point. And he says, basically, uh, these people are in their churches or uh, have membership roles, and yet it has not changed the way that they live. What's so pitiful about my sister, she interprets for, for the deaf people in, in her church, mm -hmm. and she tells them that they can save themselves. Mm -hmm. I just can't get into it. I get really upset when I think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you have to pray for, in a situation like mm -hmm. that because... Uh, a person that's got their mind made up, you're not going to change them mm -hmm. with uh, salt water. She's you're going to so, have to. She's so precise and she thinks she's right, and everybody else is wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, she, and her favorite saying is, but Betty, when I try to, you know, <laughs> show her scripture, or whatever, but Betty, <laughs> but Betty, no, I said, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to go along with what I believe. Yeah. What the scriptures teach. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Uh, Kenny, you want to dismiss us to word of prayer? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this gathering today. We're here to serve you and, and to worship you, Father, for this day. And we thank you for the message that you sent us through Brother Ray. We thank you that we're part of the vine. And we pray for those who are, Lord, that they might come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And trust in him and him only. In the precious blood he poured out at Calvary. Go with us now and help us, Lord, that we might be able to, to tell people of this message and this truth so that they might trust Jesus. Go with us now and protect us and bring us back at the next appointed meeting, Lord, assembly, and just save those we love that are lost today to be your will. In the precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.